the speech that was referred to, I don't know if uh, people had a chance to look at it, uh, but uh, back in the summer first, Mark Gill made a speech that was entitled The Sky is Falling and kind of spoke a lot about the uh, collapse of what people call the independent film business. And I was asked to uh, speak at Film Independent, which is a LA-based uh, indie film uh, collective, uh, you yeah. know, group, and kind of gave a counter argument uh, that was uh, entitled uh, A Thousand Phoenix uh, Rising, mm -hmm. and uh, how, a, how a, a truly free film culture will rise from independence to ashes. I was frustrated at film school because at that time everyone just felt you had to go off and go to Hollywood, and I uh, had the good fortune of having seen uh, a bunch of foreign films at a young age and really wanted to make kind of personal movies that, that spoke to me like those European films. And um, when I first, sorry to ramble, but that's what I do. Um, when I first moved to New York, uh, I had the, the good fortune of uh, arriving when, um, I guess it was the first time that, or the second time that punk rock broke, I would say, in 1981. And, and kind of feeling like that do-it-yourself, pick up a guitar, who cares if you can't sing, you got a lot of energy, maybe you know, it, it will work out for a little while. And uh, kind of that aesthetic carrying over to, uh, in the course of uh, two weeks, I think kind of a seminal experience for me was, uh, I lived up on the Upper West Side and uh, went to school at NYU. And, my activities, for some reason, frequently had me up around 1 a.m. Uh, craving Captain Crunch. <laughs> and there was only one 24-hour grocer at that point, and we had to walk several blocks. My roommates and I would always encounter some other people trying to make that big decision of Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries, Captain Crunch without Crunch Berries, with, without, with, without. And we would see these, like, three, we call them freaks, um, trying to make that decision frequently. And when I bought my ticket to my first time to the New York Film Festival, I had to sit in the second row, so I was really close. And uh, I was shocked when uh, the movie ended. It was this great kind of southern, gothic, James M. Cain esque piece with uh, some brand new actors. I hadn't seen one of them who was up there on the screen just then at the time. And uh, lo and behold, they brought the, the the three people from the, the 24 hour grocery out, and it was Joel, Ethan Cohen, and Fran McDormand. And I was like, holy cow. And at that time, uh, there was a theater. Uh, um, I could only afford one ticket to the New York Film Festival, that was the ticket I bought. But luckily, another movie from the festival opened that week across the street. It was in the cinema studio on 66, called Strange in Paradise. And I went to see it, and when I went in, there was. Uh, this, this guy kind of uh, harassing people, handing them flyers to go see his movie. And I sat down in the theater and they showed this trailer, which was uh, shot in the front of the theater. And it was the same guy that had been asking you to go see the, the movie, but here he was selling socks. And it was Spike Lee. And it was like, wait, that's the guy that was outside? And it's like, holy moly. Uh, and literally a week after that, when I got off the subway to go down to NYU, the subway doors opened and Jim Jarmusch w was in front of me. And I was like, wow, these are the people that are making all these movies that I want to see in all these films. You know, were, were made for next to nothing. There's got to be another way to, to do it. For a long time, we've been looking at the, the, the film business in terms of just uh, taking the status quo for granted. The, the film business has relied on a structure of uh, impulsivity in the way people make their choices. They're not choices, they're impulses. Uh, it's kind of been forced by the way that the business works and that to the, to the, up until this time, it's very much been a kind of gatekeeper, limited supply economy. One that uh, is based on what the studios choose to give you and you have to take what's there, but yet, for the last 10 years, we've seen this increase, this huge surge in production, right? Um, 3,600 films last year applied to Sundance. Want to bet that this year it's like 3,800, you know, at least, if not 4,000. 
Um, as I understand it, uh, 500 films were made in China last year, 650 in Japan, 1,200 in Europe. That's a huge amount of movies that you have a choice between each year to watch. And the fact is, most of you aren't making choices. Whatever it is that you, you, you're spending your time doing, you truly have to start to make a choice if you're living in the real world. And that's very counter to the way that entertainment previously has been consumed. But you have a tremendous number of tools now at your disposal to help you access those films and make those, those choices. And as the, the, uh, the business model starts to shift, you know, which basically what the business model has been since 1994, when Pulp Fiction kind of changed everything, ha has been trying to find films that fit a predicated spend as opposed to figuring out how much money you should spend to market it based on what the film is. Which means that the buyers, the distributors, the people that generally make the choices, look for something that they feel they already have an understanding of, and thus are kind of shut down to a large degree of something really new. Um, and I myself ha have always found, in terms of the films that, that I like to see, and um, the films that I, I believe succeed from the independent sector, it's always those films that truly make themselves distinct. Distinct in the marketplace, or distinct uh, in terms of what has come before them. And that's, I've had several times, I've been working on projects where the, the buyers, the distributors say, say to me, oh, we, we love this, it's truly unique, it's something we would really like to do, but you only have one of them. We can't like build a, uh, a structure, a system to just handle one. We need to keep the supply going. We're finally free of that, is ba basic what I'm getting to. So that, that as artists, as people wanting to make movies that, that speak to you personally, we're at a much freer time if you choose to act responsibly, which uh, doesn't mean you can't, well, don't go drink and drive, but uh, what, what I basically mean by that is Filmmaking, making your movie, is about 50% of your job as filmmakers. The other 50% these days is very much bringing your film to the audience. When I uh, started working as a producer, the, the job was to have a good script. And after that, it became that you had to package it. You had to find the cast and the director and bring it in. And then, you know, around the mid-90s, uh, it really was looked at you not you can you had you had to figure out how you were putting together your whole financial plan where you were finding the money, um, and in 2000 you had to really start to demonstrate where the profits came from. You had to do uh, a P&L, profit and loss statement, or some sort of real foreign estimates by people they would trust. These days, you know, really 2008 you're responsible for bringing the audience to your movie too. Not all of it, but a big part of it.